It's my distinct pleasure this morning to kick off our first session of this family forum and to introduce our speakers on the topic of Duchenne standards of care and shared decision making. We are honored to have with us today Dr. Craig Campbell, who is a champion of all that we do at Defeat Duchenne Canada. And I think it's safe to say that Craig is seen as the go-to guy in Canada when it comes to Duchenne and someone I am happy to call a friend. At Children's Hospital here in London, Dr. Campbell has developed an outstanding center for clinical care and research in pediatric neuromuscular disease. He is the medical director of the Pediatric Neuromuscular Clinic and the Pediatric Neurophysiology Laboratory. He is the founding leader of the Canadian Pediatric Neuromuscular Group and has been instrumental in the development of the Canadian Neuromuscular Disease Registry, which Defeat Duchenne Canada is very proud to have supported. And we continue to support that group. Ms. Bonnie Wooten is a registered nurse and a project consultant working at London Health Science Centre for almost 20, uh, pardon me, almost 10 years. She has led and been responsible for internal, regional and provincial projects. Currently, she is the pediatric shared decision making implementation consultant and decision coach at Children's Hospital. Ladies and gentlemen, please join me in welcoming Dr. Craig Campbell and Bonnie Wooten. Thank you, everyone. Uh, it's wonderful to be here. Uh, welcome to all the folks online that, um, oh, perfect, thank you. And this has a, does this have a pointer too? No? Okay, do we, um, is there a way to uh, highlight things with a mouse on, on the screen or? be ideal for a few of the things but um, anyways welcome listen it's my great privilege to be here and um uh and, and my great privilege to have been um on the journey with uh, defeat duchenne from very early years when i landed here in my faculty position and uh, to see the evolution of the organization under um the leadership of John and then uh, at Rick and, and now uh, many people on the team, a really um, impactful organization that has, uh, you know, has, has seen the gaps at, in, in the Canadian neuromuscular landscape um, and, and gone out and filled them. And so we have much to be proud of and thankful for, uh, for, um, uh, for Defeat Duchenne. So I'm going to open uh, talking a little bit about standards of care, and uh, I, I'm pleased to share the stage with Bonnie Wooten, who has been a real innovator, and, and uh, how we're going to divide this up, probably about kind of half and half of the session. So I'll, I'm going to start with the sort of some of the aspects around standard of care. I, I, I'll just put some disclosures here. I have worked, obviously, with many many um, partners in the biopharmaceutical arena, and uh, those have been very positive interactions. Um, and I, I list them here. I do like to make it just very clear that I do not take any money uh, personally for any uh, drug um, company partner. Uh, those, uh, if I do get consulting work or um, or, or go to meetings or, or go to Health Canada with them, I, I take all that money and I, I just put it in a charitable account in my corporation and, and um, I give it away. The only money I do take personally is data safety monitoring uh, committee uh, board money. And uh, as many of you will know, that's a arm's length activity from the from the activities of the study and it's um and and it's uh, difficult work and important work so um anyway so those are disclosures uh today what i'm going to try and um, do in in this first half of the session is talk a little bit about kind of the key highlights around diagnosis steroid management or some orthopedic care cardiac and um and then respiratory what I'm not going to cover, which are a big part of the care guidelines, 
are things about bone health and endocrinology, because we have, uh, as, as has already been noted, really the world knowledge leader in, in that area in DMD, Leanne Ward. Um, emergency issues, again, a close colleague and, and leader in this area, Laura McAdam from Bloorview. Uh, weight management uh, with Dr. Marina Yabera, who is uh, our newest faculty at Children's Hospital. We're going to talk about psychosocial issues with Rhonda and Natalie and Ortho uh, tomorrow, a little bit with Cheryl Schultes. And all these folks are, of course, in the audience, and hopefully you can connect with them during lunches, coffees, afterwards, because uh, this is like a, 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 an outstanding uh, team who's here. I know there are many other speakers, and I this was just when I went to sort of map some of the, the components in the um, care guideline, really, really realizing uh, the folks that are in our midst and the uh, expertise you have available to you this weekend around some of these. So so what are the care guidelines like where what are those where do we draw our um our statements and our concepts uh from and um and and the dmd community across the world has made a commitment to developing care guidelines and renewing them uh, on a regular basis and the last uh, renewal of those were in 2018 those are published in a prominent medical journal called Lancet Neurology and consists of three papers here. So I bring those to you just if someone wants to have a deeper dive, a little more granular uh, and look at the um, uh, some of the specific references uh, around some of the recommendations. These are the three papers you can go to and, and I'm happy for you to, to e email me. I'm gonna draw out obviously at a, at a much different level than what the paper goes into uh, for today's uh, session. I would like to pause. I, I, I know um, obviously defeat Duchenne well known to all of you and and um, it'll be clear uh, the impact they've had of I previously mentioned but specific to the care guidelines I, I just wanted to give a little bit of a hand uh, specifically uh, to an activity that defeat Duchenne um, really spearheaded in 2021 where they did a survey amongst all DMD experts across Canada and then they um, collated that response and folded it into three sessions uh, with um, bringing together multiple experts from across Canada to discuss the standards of care. And this was really a very um, worthwhile effort. Uh, it, it not only raised awareness around the standards of care, but really connected people, uh, experts from across uh, Canada to get in the same room and, and really um, talk about what, what we're doing in, in each of the centers. And, um, and, and so this was a, a, you know, really a commendable effort uh, and, and very helpful for our Canadian community. So I like to make sure I always start with this uh, slide. It's actually sadly not in the 2018 care guidelines that were, were updated. This goes back to the last version of the care guidelines um, in 2011 uh, that um, was published under the leadership of Kate Bushby, one of the giants in our field. But really, this is where we need to start. The, the central uh, feature of this being you know, the, the person with, with DMD in the very center, the family around them, and this um, sense of, of uh, not surrounding, but <laughs> supporting, you know, in a, in a comprehensive way, um, the, the family and uh, who's on this journey. And you'll see the many, many aspects of, uh, I mean, this is not lost on you, you're, you're on this journey, but um, you know, the many, many aspects of care that need to be uh, done thoughtfully. And um, so I, I think this diagram grounds us in, in, in those things. So as I said, I'm gonna start and go through a few of the areas, starting uh, first with, um, you know, with diagnosis. I was, alarmed uh, um, when as part of the, actually I led the 4DMD study in Canada. This was a large study of steroid regimens, which I'll show you a bit later. Um, but one of the things that came out of that, um, the results of that study was that 
Canada, amongst all our global partners, had the highest age of diagnosis for DMD. And um, that's led us to understand a little bit more that we've we've got some real work to do, I think, in, in educating um, some of our general pediatric colleagues, um, awareness in in the um, in the in the public about DMD, and uh, so that was a real call for us. And I, you know, I know uh, we talked about this uh, during some of our standard of care uh, meetings as well. But I, I, this is an area that that uh, I think you know is important for um, organizations like Defeat Duchenne and MDC and, and all of us as part of the community to um, uh, um, to, to look at, especially as we get to a point of having. Uh, some therapeutic options available to to our boys. Um, again, I, I'm not going to go into great detail specifically about genetic diagnosis and that. What I'm trying to do is maybe pull out a few pearls that I, I think people need to be aware of. Um, in this era of genetic diagnosis, really no one um, needs a biopsy or, or EMG anymore. And I'm, I'm still um, seeing that some uh, people are are saying that they were scheduled for a biopsy in their in their community or had an EMG done, and that's you know those are not the most pleasant uh, undertakings, and and uh, so that that actually doesn't really need to happen uh, almost ever uh, in um, with the genetic tools we have uh, now, and certainly you do not need a liver biopsy. This is another thing I want people to take away. Um, not only in the journey of diagnosis, but even along the way, it's amazing how many families will come and say, oh, my family doctor or my pediatrician did some liver tests and, and you know, were you aware my son has liver disease? Well, the, the enzymes, the blood tests that are in the liver are also in the muscle. And it's not uncommon that, a, you know, a family doc or pediatrician wouldn't, would not know that. They don't live, you know, seeing lots of kids with with, with muscle diseases. So we do have kids who end up going through, uh, you know, they're seeing a liver specialist and they end up going through a liver biopsy until finally someone says, oh, I should measure the muscle enzymes as well. And, um, and lo and behold, it's, uh, this is related to, um, uh, to, to uh, you know, the muscle problem, the, the Duchenne rather than a liver thing. And that goes for mums who are carriers as well, right? So uh, many mums who are carriers will have an elevated CK and, um, uh, and, and that, you know, and as again, as part of that, they'll have high liver, what we typically in, in, in medicine call liver enzymes, but the recognition that they're also in muscle is really important um, uh, to avoid unnecessary uh, investigations. Please get a copy of your genetic test result when you can. That's important for you. I mean, it's it's your um, uh, your genetic information. But but more so than that, uh, you know, I think many of the emerging therapies, which we're going to talk about this afternoon, are based on the type of mutation that you have. So it's really important as you you know um, interact with specialists, think about potential uh, clinical trial opportunities, or even therapies that are emerging on the market that you understand understand that, uh, that mutation type. And then, you know, the one thing I, uh, is, you know, really important around the time of diagnosis and even beyond that is to make sure that, you know, mothers of a boy who have DMD, aunts, sisters should get the information that they need from a genetic perspective. And it's a complicated thing. It's difficult to go through that genetic counseling, but um, you know, it's really important that you're armed with the, um, the information about your, your own genetic uh, makeup as it relates to dystrophin um, and can make choices and, and decisions about your health and family. So. Um, obviously, at the time of diagnosis, it's uh, it's a you know devastating news for families. That's not, um, I mean, you'll all understand that very uh, intimately here, and, um, and and it's and it's very difficult to grapple with that uh, devastating news and and. Um, 
I, I know um, uh, Rhonda and, and uh, Natalie are going to talk to you about that uh, a little bit later today, but uh, really that's a time that our team has to come together, support that adjustment to, um, uh, uh, to things. You know, uh, the other thing that happens, I think, often around that time, even though most of the time the diagnosis is focused on some motor things, it, it's become quite clear that many families are struggling with some learning and behavioral uh, issues um, that are actually uh, likely um, more problematic for, for you and your child. And so we set out to understand that. And I just uh, wish I had a po pointer here, but I put this red box around. We, we, we looked at this in young boys um, recently diagnosed with, uh, with DMD and asked which were the things that impacted most on a family's health-related quality of life. And we measured that in four different ways across the top panel. And we, we lined up a number of their medical issues, but we also looked at four sort of behavioral and learning scales. And... Um, uh, you know, again, it won't be much of a surprise to you, but this is the sort of the statistical way of looking at it, that the learning and behavioral challenges were certainly driving um, a, a lot of the early challenges that families are, are facing. And so having people involved at that stage who can help you uh, navigate that is, uh, you know, is, is understandably very important. I'm going to talk a little bit about steroid therapy um, here. Uh, of course, uh, at this point, steroids are still um, the only treatment that we have easily available uh, for, uh, for DMD, certainly in Canada. Um, and, and in Canada, deflazacort is widely used. That's uh, largely practice pattern over the years. Uh, we looked to um, uh, a giant in our field, Doug Bigger, who helped pave the way for a lot of uh, the deflazacort studies in Canada. And, um, and so it, it's generally our practice to use that uh, here in Canada. And we ideally want to start that uh, younger, around four years of age, which is why, uh, again, we have to be uh, in concert at trying to get those uh, age of diagnosis down a little bit um, uh, here in Canada, so we identify uh, boys earlier can, and can start really this uh, proven uh, therapy. I mean, every study that has looked at steroids in various forms has really shown that improvement on motor uh, outcomes and many other um, um, long-term outcomes as well. In fact, we recently just completed uh, the 4-DMD study. This was a really um, anticipated uh, uh, investigator-driven study of different steroid regimens in um, uh, DMD that was run across the world. We enrolled uh, uh, almost 250 boys in the trial and, and measured three different regimens of steroids, uh, daily deflazacort, daily prednisone, and intermittent uh, prednisone. I wanted to show you the results from this paper. This just came out uh, earlier this year. Um, Again, I apologize, I don't have a pointer, but you can see on the bottom, uh, so this is following um, the boys' motor scores over the 36, a three-year study, uh, the 36 um, uh, months of the study. And the top two bars, uh, the, the blue and the yellow, are following motor scores um, in daily prednisone and daily deflazacort. And the bottom sort of gray, gray bar um, or gray boxes is intermittent prednisone. And so the, the purpose of this study was to really see, you know, are daily prednisone and daily deflazacort um, equivalent in, t in terms of their effectiveness um, in, in boys who are newly diagnosed and newly starting on uh, steroids over the first uh, three years. And you can see um, that, in fact, the, the daily prednisone and daily deflazacort look quite comparable, where the intermittent prednisone uh, uh, tends to track below that and fall a little more quickly over time. And, and so... Um, Part of the, the other part of this study was to not only understand the profile of, of the effectiveness, but also the side effect profile. And um, this um, uh, graph 
tabulated the different uh, side effects from uh, each of the study arms, so daily prednisone, daily deflazacort, and inter intermittent prednisone. And, and what I put in, in the blue boxes here are the areas where um, we often are concerned about side effects, abnormal behavior, uh, a steroid appearance uh, uh, to the body, high blood pressure. Um, and, and you can see across the blue bars, all these are fairly comparable in the two regimens. Where there was differences between the two groups is uh, in, the, in the red boxes and, and um, in weight gain, which we've known from other data or felt we had a sense from other data uh, that wasn't necessarily prospective, but deflazacort does appear to have a um, less weight gain than uh, prednisone, but the uh, rate of cataracts is, tends to be higher uh, in, um, uh, in, in deflazacort. So these sort of help confirm um, in, a, in a high quality uh, randomized trial, uh, some of the things that we had uh, suspected about these drugs. So uh, a couple of other notes on steroids therapy, and, and I know Laura and um, uh, Leanne Ward are gonna go into this later, but I, I can't be said enough. Do not stop uh, steroids suddenly. There's lots of repercussions from that. We do tend to maintain steroid lifelong. Uh, that's um, common across the world, but particularly uh, in Canada, that tends to be the practice, and, and that's for the lifelong benefits that we see with um, uh, steroids. We like to make sure immunizations are up to date before starting steroids because they are an immune suppressant. You may not respond to immunizations uh, as well once you have that. And, and of course, managing weight gain and the other side effects are really a key part of, of um, being on steroid and, and managing them pro proactively. So in terms of uh, uh, general health, uh, vitamin D and calcium, again, you're going to hear a lot more about that uh, later, but really um, many other supplements uh, families want to experiment with, and that's fine. We don't know of any other supplements that are exactly proven in clinical trials, but many are not harmful, and it's good to do those, you know, um, you know talk with uh, the healthcare team about those. I've talked about vaccinations as being essential. I've listed the ones uh, there. The next two points I wanted to just focus on is surgical care. Um, that should be done really thoughtfully in conjunction with your DMD care team. And there's a whole section in the care guidelines about uh, how to manage um, anesthesia and, and surgical um, issues. And the other thing I tend to tell my families, um, again, not, not as a way to be uh, um, critical of care outside of uh, the DMD centers, but it's just a familiarity with things is to always um, call us if your child gets admitted to an outside, you know, hospital. There's just a, a lack of familiarity with some of the issues in DMD, particularly steroid treatment, and, and those need to be um, addressed carefully and quickly uh, in the setting of illness. So, uh, so, so please have that relationship with your DMD care team. And the other thing that I always, uh, you know, I'd like to focus on is, is fatigue management. And I'm not going to go into this in great detail, uh, but this is from a study we published a couple of years ago now, I think probably in 2019, where again, we were looking at, you know, impact of, of certain factors on quality of life. And there's a lot of medical and, and uh, household uh, kind of family elements that go into that. But the single greatest predictor of, of quality of life from um, both the parent and the child uh, perspective was fatigue. So be aware of that in your child, um, especially in that sort of ambulatory decline phase where, you know, people are often trying to push, push things. And of course, you know, going into a wheelchair is a very negative milestone for, 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 for of course. But, uh, you know, we need to be aware of fatigue management strategies uh, to make the day-to-day -day, uh, stuff uh, feel a little better for everyone. So um, from a cardiac perspective, a couple of points I want to pull out of the care guidelines. A fast heart rate is very common in DMD. That, that's actually you know, sort of the norm uh, to have this, you may hear this term tachycardia, that's very, very common. So, uh, and, and typically not, you know, not harmful. Uh, 
Uh, an annual ECG and echo is important. Some centers are beginning to do cardiac MRI, and that's great. It can show changes earlier on than, than ECG and echo. But at this point, I don't believe it to be necessary to have a cardiac MRI. All of uh, the boys should be started on, a, on a, what's called an ACE inhibitor, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitor, um, really at the first sign of any cardiac abnormality or for sure by the age of 10 years. And that's a new phenomenon in the, in the 2018 guidelines. So please be, be aware of that. And, and if the heart is struggling, if it's not pumping well, other medications uh, may be needed, but that's usually done in conjunction uh, with, with your cardiologist. And always be cautious. Um, the, the difficulty with the heart in Duchenne is often the pumping function of the heart, but there are uh, um, concern around rhythm abnormalities in the heart. So I always ask people to just be very cautious of getting medications, either, either the over-the-counter or by prescription, that cause uh, arrhythmia. So from a, a, an orthopedic perspective, and I separate this a little bit from um, the bone health that you're going to hear about uh, later, some of the things I want to um, highlight here uh, is the focus on ankle contracture. There's two things that preserve ambulation well. One is, uh, is your strength. And of course, we're always looking, as, as you'll hear uh, from, from uh, many of the talks over the weekend, to improve the actual strength or the underlying weakness that ensues because of the dystrophin uh, problem. But the other is, is balance and, and the biomechanics of walking. And so uh, developing ankle contractures, so that's tightening at the ankles where, where you can't get your foot flat on the ground anymore, is, is a real problem with um, maintaining good ambulation. Uh, so, so really focus on those. It should be a really critical part of the early management to keep those ankles in good shape. Um, exercise is important. Again, more aerobic, submaximal exercise, so you're not damaging the muscle. Uh, sw things like swimming and biking are excellent to be involved with because, of course, that takes away some of the gravity and r injury risk, um, especially, you know, some of the teens really like being on a stationary bike, can watch their shows or play their video games while they're biking. Fall prevention is critical. Uh, we, we really, I feel, have to do a lot more work in this area to, um, uh, to, to make families aware of, of of, of uh, the risk of falls and really safe-proof uh, homes, uh, because a fall typically leads to uh, being off the off the feet for a while, and that uh, then means um, a progression of weakness uh, that that is not often recoverable. And uh, and please reach out to your care team if you ex if your boy experiences a fracture, because again, uh, there's strategies for getting kids back on their feet fairly quickly after a fracture that will be known to your DMD care team, but maybe not as familiar to um, uh, outside centers. Um, and then I'm going to finish on breathing support and. Um, uh, I, you know, I, I think the message here is there's lots of. Um, of proactive things that we're doing in this uh, space and and some of the leaders in this area are Canadian um, uh, folks like Sherry Katz in at CHEO. Uh, so things like lung volume recruitment, cough assist and 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 BiPAP. And in the care guidelines you'll see there are there are um, numbers attached to to when to start these things. But I I think the real message here is to is to get in the habit of doing these things early and often uh, so you feel confident about them uh, in, a, in a preventative way. And then when, you know, when a pneumonia comes along or an upper respiratory tract infection, you're, you're equipped and armed and confident uh, using these um, uh, techniques. And, um, and, uh, and of course, you know, probably of all the uh, um, interventions that have uh, come to be standard of practice in, in DMD BiPAP use uh, is really essential, but, it, but it's often very difficult to initiate. And, um, and, and I think, you know, we really need strategies to help kids adopt this and families to be able to put this into place. And in fact, um, we're going to talk about shared decision making next. And, 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 uh, and we've embedded shared decision making in our approach to BiPAP. Uh, um, and, and, and we're hoping that that will 
help with the compliance and the ability to uh, uh, to to use use BiPAP. I mentioned Sherry Katz. Um, she she just finished this study uh, this year. We we published this uh, earlier, and in the graph you can see on the top bar um, in in the sort of orangey uh, color. Um, kids who who did lung volume recruitment uh, measure or uh, activities twice a day versus kids in the blue band who 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 just did lung volume recruitment sort of as needed or you know uh, as per uh, their usual pattern and you can see that um, uh, kids who did lung volume recruitment over uh, two years who made a commitment to doing it uh, twice a day really uh, did maintain their um, their pulmonary function better. Unfortunately, this didn't reach statistical significance, uh, but but you can clearly see the trend uh, the trend here. So um, uh, with that, we're going to transition to the next thing. But I, I did want to just. Um, uh, you know, say that I think we're very fortunate in Canada to have some of the top experts in the world in the DMD uh, field, some of them right here in this room. Um, really consistent, high level of care no matter where you go. Uh, there's access to clinical trials and research really across Canada. I would say we've been involved in every single major um, uh, clinical trial in, in DMD uh, since the very first PTC trial. That was our, our starting point. Um, and, uh, um, uh, and, and a highly collaborative atmosphere. So we work all together, uh, not only as, as clinicians and healthcare teams, but as a whole community. And of course, uh, committed patient organizations. And I couldn't you know, speak more highly of uh, Duchenne Canada. There's so many things they've done that you, you know, I'm not even sure the community is is fully aware of uh, their thoughtfulness um, in uh, in partnering. You know, with all of us, uh, it has been um, amazing. And so uh, I always end with like like to end with this that you know I'm committed. Uh, uh, to you guys, I, I I don't know if I'm the go-to person for DMD, but I, I do share my email out a lot, and um, happy to you know if you're struggling, we don't we don't want you out there struggling. I know that from all my colleagues, we you know from our patient organizations, we do not want you out there struggling. And if you're struggling uh, with a question, if you're struggling with things, we, I, I'm committed. I know all my colleagues are to um, to help you get connected with the the right help. So, uh, so please use my email. Uh, so we're going to move to, um, I don't know if it keeps going on to the Bonnie's. Okay. So, so uh, as I mentioned at the start, I'm thrilled, thrilled, thrilled to share the stage with Bonnie Wooten. Uh, Bonnie is, um, oh, no, this is not, uh, Bonnie is the uh, pro project manager and, um, uh, and decision coach for our shared decision making program at, uh, at Children's Hospital um, in, in London. But Bonnie's reach goes far beyond that. Bonnie has, um, has taken this innovative uh, tool that families can, can use and, and taken it out into community organizations, into patient advocacy groups. We've worked with Epilepsy Support Centre and Muscular Dystrophy Canada and Defeat Duchenne and um, uh, uh, many, many organizations. And, and so we're going to give you a little bit of insight today into shared decision making. Uh, and how we're using that as a tool, not only in the neuromuscular space, but across um, uh, many healthcare conditions in children's. And I, I really feel this is um, central to uh, real person-centered uh, care. And I think you'll understand that when you hear a little bit more uh, from Bonnie. So Bonnie, over to you. Oh, thank you, thank you. Um, thank you for, uh, defeat Duchesne and inviting um, myself to be part of the platform here today. I really appreciate it. And as Dr. Campbell talked about um, information that was really key to families um, fighting this disease, we also um, have involved shared decision making as a way of um, highlighting and providing support to families who are in situational difficulties in trying to make decisions for themselves. For example, what trials would I become involved in? Should I become involved in? 
And Dr. Campbell talked about uh, steroids and coming off of those or not coming off of those. We do get families who are trying to make decisions on that. And uh, a coach can be very helpful in those situations. Um, what I wanted to start with, because I know we have people on remote here, and I'm sorry that you might um, lose some of, of the intent of this next exercise. At your tables, um, you would have received um, a brochure called Chair Decision Making, and that um, tells you a little bit about the program that we have at Children's and also the role of the decision coach, so um, it might be very helpful. Also, um, you received um, uh, Ottawa... Uh, decision guide, family decision guide. I thought we could do a little bit of an exercise to show you um, what, how you can use this and how you can, um, if you have family or friends or you have others that are um, struggling with in a decisional situation, this is a really great tool. I use it on my coaching with every family that I coach. It doesn't always have to be a medical decision. It could be a, um, a situation or trans transitional situation. It could be, um, you might be trying to decide whether you're gonna move or you're gonna stay, you're gonna put your child in a new school or do you not put them in a new school? Um, there are different ways that you could use this tool and decision-making isn't always about a medical decision. So first of all, I just want to ask, um, how many know what shared decision-making is? And just raise your hand. So a few. How many know what a decision coach is or does? S sort of the same kind of thing. So this is great, this is good. So we can share more information. We do have um, some slides, some educational slides, but we decided that we'll put those online for you. We do have educational sessions that we hold um, at the last Monday of every month. And I have the um, links that if you're interested in being part of those and want to come and join in and Dr. Campbell and myself do those sessions and educate the families with the evidence and how to use shared decision making. And we have didactic discussions with the family so that they understand. Um, of course, it's an hour session, so you can't do everything in an hour, but it will give you information. And then you can further um, consult with myself if you have further um, discussions or, or issues. On your table, what I wanted you to look at is that um, tool. And when you look at the tool, um, I want you to think of a decisional situation that you've faced lately. Um, what would that be? Does anyone want to volunteer and take us, we could take you through that? Might be a choice of a wheelchair, might be um, changing a medication, might be does my child need surgery or not? Does anyone have a decisional situation they want to share? It doesn't have to be personal, you can make it up. No one? Sorry, one volunteer. Oh yeah, I want to volunteer, <laughs> thanks. Um, maybe a good one might be um, the decision to start by path. Okay, let's take that tool and work that through. So your decisional situation is whether my child needs BiPAP or not, right? So the next question is when do you have to make a decision, right? Is that if you follow that tool, it's when do you have to make a decision? So you have to think about that, right? Does it is it right away? Do you have a long time to make a decision? Normally those decisions are suggested when you come into clinic and they're fairly soon, right? Is that what you're your thinking yeah. is. And then so um, I think if you look at that tool again and you look down, it talks about, um, have you made a decision? Are you still thinking about it? Are you looking at options? I'm trying to remember everything on that tool. Um, and uh, then as you go down into the body of it, um, you look at options. Thanks. And those questions are really important for you to consider about, have I thought about the options? Am I thinking about the options? Am I close to making a choice or have I already made a choice? Really, really important what stage you're at when we go into a consultation. Um, and as you go down, you can see that we're going to be looking at your knowledge level, your values, and, your, and how certain are you about your decision. So you have options, right? The op you could have three options, you could have two options, you could have one. 
One option would be the recommendation that's being made about BiPAP, if that's what we're using. So what you would do is what my responsibility to you is and your physician is we come together to talk with you about your knowledge level. So what are the risks and benefits of BiPAP? How much do you know about it? And many times when I work with families, they don't have a lot of information. They have what you have learned in your clinic or your visit to your physician, but not a lot of detailed information. So that's what role I play. I facilitate the decision making for you. I don't make your decision for you. I facilitate you having the knowledge and the information to make a preferred decision. So you'd be looking at all the uh, risks and benefits of going on BiPAP. And then you would look at um, what is the value of that? So the next column when it says, how much does it matter to you? That's rated using a five-star approach. Is it really important to you? Is it not so important? Is it highly rated? Five stars would mean it'd be really important to you. So that would be really telling in your preferred decision as to where that sits for you. And then of course, if you move to the other side, it's the reasons to avoid that selection. And another option might be, you know, I want to maybe hold it off for a period of time. I'm kind of making this up. So I'm just thinking those who have had that decision making, you might not want to do it right away, but you'll reconsider it in a month, in a year, whatever. And you, we'd look again at the risks and benefits of doing that. And then there's always the option of doing nothing. Now, physicians don't like that when I, when I say that because they feel there's always an option and that they should not, we should not be offering nothing, but it is an option. It is a true option to do nothing and walk away. And you have to look at the risks and benefits of doing that. Did you wanna say anything on that one? No, I mean, it's just really important because I mean, I think in our, in our, you know, busy healthcare system and that we, you know, we, we do, you know, I think the paradigm in the biomedical thing is to, is to, to do more and, and, and so sometimes pausing and just realizing exactly that, um, you know, maybe staying at the status quo is, is, is actually a choice um, that is important to consider. And the other thing that does is really, um, you know, it really empowers everyone in the decision to 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 really step back and say, you know what, we are in control of this decision. We don't have to necessarily, um, you know, always choose more and more intervention, right? So, yeah, for those two reasons, I think having that um, uh, that as a as part of the choice awareness is is important. I think the BiPAP was a really good situation. I did have a referral not long ago. Um, the family um, were deciding, I think they were deciding about a year. I think it, it took quite a period of time. Um, although they were on the brink, but just couldn't quite make the decision. And I think it got interpreted as if they didn't want, want BiPAP. When I met with the family, they understood what the BiPAP did and the, and the benefits to it. What they didn't have was enough information. They didn't have the knowledge level to make that next, do, go that next step to saying, yes, we're going to move forward. So, you know, it depends. Um, sometimes the reasoning is, is um, and the reasons why people say, say no or can't make a decision are not what they appear. And when you have an opportunity to sit on a one-on-one -on -one for, the consults are usually an hour um, and work through with the family um, so that they have enough information and knowledge to make a decision. And as you work through the tool, you will see that um, when you get to the part where it says, which option will you choose? You choose one, two, or three. It, kind, it is your preferred decision. You end up with a preferred decision based on where you put your strengths and where you put your um, values. And so knowledge is, is really, really important in, in, cons in doing a consult. And many times, as you know, you're rushing through. And I always um, uh, support families not to go to Dr. Google. Do not go to Dr. Google because your issue and your decision and your um, diagnosis has to be tailored to you and your child, not someone else's. And it can get you carried away, especially on drugs and medications. 
um, that kind of thing. Um, I have worked with families who have tried to make a decision around steroids. The mom didn't want her child on steroids because she thought he looked different. He was different in his behavioral approach. Dad didn't see the same thing. So when you bring the parents together to do the consult, it's very important they're together because sometimes they don't hear one another. You know, you're all busy with your life. You do other things at home. You think you're communicating with one another. But when you get into a consult and you have to really hear what each other is saying in a room, it makes a difference because then dad heard what mom was saying and mom heard what dad was saying. Of course, um, in the decision making there, the issue was around um, um, not being able to, if the child came off the steroid, um, having involvement in another study was kind of a deal breaker. They would not be able to do that. So that was a deal breaker. But what we did come to a decision on so that mom could have um, a, a better option of looking at what else was there available. The neurologist, we were in touch with the neurologist who were going to reassess the child again and look at maybe an alternate, <laughs> an alternate medication that would be um, uh, might be more helpful. So um, this this was a really good one, um, and the parents were really happy with the outcome, and then followed through with their neurologist, so that um, um, they had made uh, they had come to a preferred decision, and both got uh, received some satisfaction on it. I always call it a preferred decision because by the time the family uh, completes their consultation with me, they then take that, it's their responsibility to go back to their physician group, their medical group, and they um, give them their impression of what they want to do and their decision. And things can change from the time they do the consult with me till they get to the medical team. So that's why I call it a preferred decision. Their final decision is the one they give to the medical team. And um, from there, I always do a consult. I write up the consult. I do have a written note that um, goes to uh, Dr. Campbell and the uh, team who made the referral. And anybody can make a referral. The family can make a referral. You don't have to have a physician make the referral. Um, your um, social work, physio, OT, anyone who identifies a specific um, problem or an issue where the family just can't get over that hump. They're just struggling. And I always encourage you, if you are struggling at the beginning, refer then, not to wait till later because it becomes very cumbersome to wait till later. And sometimes people are looking for second opinions by that time. So I always encourage people to, to move forward. Um, I don't, uh, I wanted to make sure, and I, uh, you may have mentioned this, Dr. Campbell, but our program has been going on since 2018 at Children's. Um, it is supported through the Children's Health Foundation, and uh, we're working on a, another grant right now through the foundation, and the focus of that is to educate families. And this is very appropriate to have us here to educate families on what shared decision making is and let you know that you have a voice and that you have a role to play in decision making. Uh, with your child. Um, so we've been pretty successful with a number of things. Um, over the years, we've had a great impact on families, not only at Children's, but um, in Ontario and across Canada. And to our knowledge, it's the only pediatric service with a decision coach in Canada. So we're really proud of that. Um, and uh, I uh, had the opportunity to, to attend the International um, Shared Decision Making Conference in June, and we're still the only pediatric center um, that has a decision coach and a shared decision making um, program that, um, and there were um, like, I think there were 27 countries represented. So we should feel very proud that we have this. And um, thank you to Dr. Campbell for his um, insight and innovativeness in bringing it to children's. I'm just very pleased that I had the opportunity to take it and, and uh, advance it and provide it to families. We do have slides and we are going to put those online for people. They are the education of it. But we also have recently just did, uh, completed and launched a video. The video highlights um, what we've done and the decision making concepts so that if you're not sure what does this look like she's talking about this and that and using this tool this this video will um, highlight and make give you the information that you would need 
um, to understand the shared decision making. And it also gives the, it impacts a family who gives their uh, view of what shared decision making is and how they felt about it. So I'm wondering if we could run that video. At London Health Sciences Centre and Children's Hospital, we are committed to providing safe, equitable and inclusive health care for everyone that walks through our doors. Since 2018, the Pediatric Shared Decision Making and Decision Coaching Program has provided innovative and patient-centric care for more than 200 families located in London and beyond. Yeah, shared decision making um, is a process of making health decisions that brings a more structured way to making health decisions. In our program, we, we have uh, uh, several components of the program, including uh, um, a set of a toolbox that physicians and other healthcare providers can use to access shared decision making material. We provide education to healthcare providers. And then the third piece of this is, is decision coaching. And decision coaching uh, really means having a, a, a person who is um, knowledgeable and has become an expert in guiding th people through a systematic approach to a healthcare decision. It's about working with the physician and the family jointly. From the physician perspective, it's ensuring that the recommendations that they've made to the family are understandable. They're in language that the family would understand and also that the risks and the benefits are accurate, that they are profiled in an accurate manner. From a family perspective, um, you work with the family to prepare them for the consultation. You prepare them for looking at considering options. You help work with them to get to a preferred decision and what that looks like, what that means. Our son got uh, diagnosed with Crohn's disease and um, obviously that's really traumatizing when you first hear that 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 term and you associate it with your child and so um, you know sort of in a state of confusion we talked to the wonderful staff here uh, a lot of folks um, gave great advice on what to do how to handle this and what the next steps were um, but there's a lot of complexity uh, involved in the process um, you know different medicines that you can you can try um, decisions that you have to make for your child and you know when you're not a medical expert you feel lost a little bit. What we learned is that they don't make the decision for you. Um, so you hear decision coach and you might expect somebody to say oh well this is what you should do for your son. Instead what the process is um, about is kind of getting out of your own way. Um, it's more of like self-reflection I think and so the decision coach what what they did was help us Kind of see the problem clearly, see what it is that we needed to actually make a decision about, and um, sort of got rid of the emotional portion of the decision making process. A decision coach is beneficial to families. Um, I think it really gives them the tool um, that enables them to tease out what is really important to them as a family. And I see that being such a benefit to all families, to parents, to even children, if they need that extra help, you know. Anything you can do to make people feel better is certainly something that is a benefit to everyone. The shared decision-making coach is there to focus specifically on the decision and bringing all those elements or pieces in that allow a, a family to be um, successful in coming to a preferred decision. What's nice and why I think it's, it should probably be supported in all hospitals is having the decision coach um, made me feel very um, fortunate to have another person to talk with and another process by which to help me make this decision, help us kind of figure out what it is that we wanted to do. So for that, I think alone, it's a great uh, resource for, for parents. I would like to extend my appreciation to both the Children's Health Foundation and Children's Hospital for funding the Shared Decision Making and Decision Coaching Program. This program reflects what equitable and inclusive healthcare looks like for families and caregivers within this community. And I'm so thankful for their continued support.
And if you want more information, you can go to our website. It, if you just um, um, go on the internet and um, it's on the brochure, but if you go, uh, if you forget, um, you can go to London Health Science Center Shared Decision Making and our website comes up and this video is on there as well as there's a toolbox there that you can go in and find all the tools that uh, we use in our decision coaching and uh, educational resources, um, decision aids that we use for different situations. And I know I've just talked to Rick and he said we should look for questions, so we must use their... Anyone uh, online with any questions, uh, and uh, if there are none from online in the, in the room, uh, happy to uh, move toward you. Any, any questions from anybody? We do have one online. We do have one online? Okay. Also in person, too. Patrick, did you want to... Yeah, yeah, do you want to say it out loud or do you want me to read it yeah, for you? I'll, I'll just bring the mic over so everybody can hear your question, okay? Yeah, thank you very much for that. Uh, so the question is, if diagnosis could be made at an earlier age, what types of interventions would you identify as critical to initiate to potentially alter the course of disease? Would these recommendations be uniquely from an orthopedic lens? So, um, uh, you know, I think uh, it's a good question. Uh, certainly, you know, I think we we are increasingly using steroids at a younger and younger age. Um, so that's really uh, um, important that we make the you know diagnosis ideally. Uh, around four years or before that. Um, I think as you put, uh, part of the question was maybe part of the answer too, you know, the the orthopedic issues, um, particularly the heel cord contractures and thinking about um, that. And then, you know, again, while we recognize that at this point there's no um, uh, disease modifying therapies approved in Canada there are um, in you know in other countries and those are um, approved in some countries even for kids who are quite young down to age two years for example Adloran is approved in in Europe and and likely some other countries uh, so even before the ability to start um, like even before the typical age of starting steroids. So there are some medications that, you know, are, uh, are available um, that, that may have an impact er earlier on. So, and, and that will be increasingly so in the coming years. So, um. Rochelle, do you want to do the online question? And, uh, and then we have one more from the floor here. All right, so the question online is, what about care for adults? What are some things to expect in terms of decision making with regards to medication, heart defibr defibrillator, et cetera? For adults on decision making? Right. What we, we, we are a pediatric oriented <laughs> um, facility and do uh, work with peds, but we have um, made it known, Dr. Campbell and myself known, that we will um, also provide um, support to adults should they have a decisional situation that they need help with? Yeah, and really, um, the the structure is the same regardless of the decision. And and you know, I'll be honest, we don't, we I don't believe we've had a consult for you know an implantable defibrillator or, or anything like that. But but the way um, Bonnie structures this, and hopefully it's clear. To, Bonnie is really outside the circle of care, so she's she's not really on the neuromuscular team or on the GI team, as you saw there, or on the epilepsy team. Um, so, so what she does is she'll, she'll go to the healthcare provider, to that team, and ask for the information that, you know, around the decision. She might go out and look at care guidelines and see what they recommend. She might go out and look at original studies and find the, the risks and benefits or other decision aids. Many health conditions already have a decision aid that's been developed, and then she'll bring that um, so she gathers all that information um, uh, and and then brings the the person who's trying to make that and really works this through the structure so it, it doesn't so much matter 
uh, the content of the of the decision, as, uh, if that makes sense. Uh, Bonnie doesn't isn't an expert. In fact, that's that's the whole point. She's not an expert in DMD in or any one disease, disease, no. <laughs> but she's an expert in guiding families through there. But she pulls the evidence together for them in a way that that they can understand and approach, if their healthcare team you know has not so. It's really important that the uh, lead of the healthcare team has this evidence because I, I choose, um, it's difficult to go into a conversation with a family that they haven't had with their medical team. It's really important that we're talking about the same thing because it would not be my, um, my position to talk about something that the medical team hasn't talked about. And Dr. Campbell is my partner in this, and so uh, he is also uh, the backup. So if, if there is a, a, um, a problem with getting those aids, uh, he does support um, helping me get those aids so that I talk with families about um, the correct uh, profile, the, the, the correct information. Thank you. Um, I just want to say thank you so much, Dr. Campbell Bonnie. This is um, an excellent program. And just to be clear too, this is available right to families um, outside of London, like across the country. It's on your website as well. And it's on our website as well if you want to get more information. Um, I do have a question though, because we talked about um, you know in the in the pediatrics, so talking to both you know mom and dad, which is great because we're going to probably change your title to decision coach and marriage counselor. So that's awesome. <laughs> You don't know the half of it, Nicola. We have we have actually done um, court court ordered, uh, um, yeah, yes. uh, between co-parenting and um, and in fact, in a little bit of a of an interesting story, we had a family that was so um, distant from each other, a couple, and and Bonnie worked with them around a medical decision. But about it, probably about a year later or six months later, their their lawyer, or their mediator, phoned us and said what did you do with that family like they are making decisions about their money about their property about their assets they're talking to one they're another, talking to one another. <laughs> so so it, you're you're actually right it, it sets the foundation for many other decision ways to work through many other decisions in your life oh yeah. that's amazing amazing thank you body <laughs> yeah. um just a quick question i do have though is so in the pediatric world we're often making decisions on behalf of our child or our young person um at what point do you, do you involve the young person and you know especially like once they start to hit their teen years mm -hmm. we try to get them more involved in the decision making so do you work with like the family unit in helping make that decision um, do you then help families I guess take because at the end of the day we can make a decision but it's the young person who has to agree to it so is that part of what you're doing as yes well as that's a really good i'm so glad you raised that there's so much to tell and you only have so much time um i always uh ask the family about their child's involvement it, uh, normally you know if it's child like four years five years they really aren't as uh, intricately involved um, but i always ask the family if they um, to include the child if they um, are able to be part of the decision making. I think seven and up has is, is been my experience, um, especially the teenagers, uh, because they're moving into transition at some point. And so uh, they are part of the decision making in the families. I always, I do see them together. I always ask um, for the child to be part of the decision making. I do all my consults by remote now. Before COVID, I did them in the clinic. But since COVID, I do them by remote, and I'm continuing to do them by remote. It's a little easier for families because um, if they work all day or they're off doing other things, they can't stop in the middle of a day and come in because um, they'd have to park. They'd have to. There's a lot of implications to getting away from your job and coming in to uh, see the decision coach. So I do them by remote, and I can do them in the evenings, and I can do them on the weekends to try to uh, appease. And that way, you get to see the child. Because if the child's in school, it doesn't work. You want it, you want the child there when you can, um, when they can be part of it. And it was interesting that Dr. Campbell mentioned uh, we did work with um, Family Court Clinic um, over COVID, and accessibility was um, some of the decisional conflicts. And those were very fascinating because the parents were still, you know, they were uh, either separated or divorced. 
they all had their issues, they both had their issues, but you bring the child into that consult and you ask them what they want, they make the decision for the parents. They made the decisions nine times out of 10 for the parents. I think this would work is what they would say. And then the parents say, do you? Okay. And that, that was kind of how that was resolved in many, many thank, cases. Thank you both very much. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Campbell and Bonnie Wooten. Great session, very informative, thank you.